And we are live in Facebook. G'day, everybody in the Business Brain Food Group. Hope you're having a great day. Awesome, awesome start to uh, to winter. Goodness me, very cold in Sydney today. I'm joined by Sarah down in Melbourne. I believe it's pretty uh, cold down there as well, eh? It is, but actually, surprisingly, not as cold as it's up there. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Uh, summer is coming, though. Which is very unusual. Normally, it's it's cold <laughs> in Melbourne. Right. But it's Sydney. That's right. What's going on, Sydney? Anyway, if you are watching this live in the Business Brain Food Group, you are getting exclusive behind the scenes first look at this podcast as we record it today. Um, you'll be able to get to see myself and Sarah chat. Uh, I will be pressing the record button in a very in a very uh, short moment. Uh, if you do have questions throughout the podcast, the benefit you have is you can ask questions live and uh, and interact live as we record the podcast. Nobody else gets that. So if you are in the uh, the BBF group, just let me know with a thumbs up or a comment that you can hear is okay. Hopefully it's all working okay. I'm just gonna quickly unmute it so I can. Definitely working, which is good. You've all got my audio in there. Sometimes I have audio issues. All right, let's get stuck into it, Sarah. Are you ready? I am ready, let's do this. All right, so I'm just seeing record. So when you're ready, you can do the pre-intro. Hi, my name is Sarah and I'm the COO of a, so a startup software company. I'm 21 times world bodybuilding champion and high performance health and business coach. And you're listening to the Business Brain Food Podcast. Brilliant. All right. Now I'm going to do my intro. Just sit tight and it'll make sense when you need to come in. All righty. <laughs> Well, welcome back to the Business Brain Food Podcast. This, my friends, is the podcast that is 100% devoted to taking you and your business to the next level. And the good news is, it doesn't matter whether you're just brand new to this business thingy, so maybe you're just scratching that entrepreneurial itch, or maybe you're like myself and you've been in business for a long, long time, you've got the scars and the wounds to prove it. No matter what, there's always something new we can do to take our business to the next level. And today is absolutely no different. Pretty excited today because I am joined by Sarah Taylor. We're going to talk high performance, all things high performance. Yeah. She's gone from uh, overweight to beat and beating depression to be 21 times world champion. So we'll get to you very shortly, Sarah. Before we get Sarah onto the show, I want to remind you that today's podcast episode is brought to you by MaxMyProfit.com.au. The team at MaxMyProfit help you build the business you imagined. So if you went into business imagining something that was more fun, maybe something that made you more money or gave you the time to do the things that you love in life, but instead you feel like you're chained to a big heavy ball and chain of worry, uh, of lack of cash flow, and maybe it's, I don't know, making you feel a little depressed yourself, a little bit of down and out about the the avenue or the way that your business is heading and you need some help, then you need to talk to the team at maxmyprofit.com.au. One of their business accelerators will work with you one-on-one -on -one to help you with everything from marketing to sales, team building, systemization, and a whole bunch more. Maxmyprofit.com.au to find out how they can help you build the business that you imagined. On another note, if you are enjoying the podcast, please leave an honest review or rating in your favorite podcast player. We do read all of your reviews and feedback. In fact, we love getting your feedback. It's what makes the show so special. Uh, and if you uh, don't have a podcast player, if you listen to this on our website, then feel free to jump into the Facebook group, the Business Brain Food Facebook group, and leave a review there. Or you can just send me a message directly if you like through the website. I read all of the feedback. Love to get it. Love, love hearing from you. So let me know what we're doing well and let me know if there's something you think we could improve. Now, on that note, I did mention the Facebook group. There's over a 1,000 entrepreneurs in there having a good old time chatting all things business and people are getting early access to this content. And if you're not in there, you're missing out. So make sure you head across to facebook.com and look for the Business Brain Food Group. All right, a lot of things there for you to do straight up, I know. But I know you're good for it. You're very intelligent and smart people because you've tuned into this show. I know you can manage it. All right, today's guest is Sarah Taylor. Sarah is an unstoppable COO and CTO of one of Melbourne's hottest startups, high-performance business and health coach, international speaker and industry leader. As a formerly obese 40-year-old, Sarah turned her life around beating depression and a complete physical breakdown and accidentally, I love this, accidentally getting into bodybuilding at the age of 42 and going on to become a 21 times world champion by age 49. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you very much for having me. Hey, my absolute pleasure. We love having people like you on the show. It's going to be interesting to hear your story. <laughs> Where do we start? Where do we start? <laughs> <Well. laughs> Tell us a bit about, uh, you know, your history, I guess. You know, did you, when you left school, I mean, it sounds like you're from the UK. Originally. Yes, I'm from, I'm from England originally. Um, I guess, I mean, my background's pretty normal. I'm pretty much an ordinary sort of person, you know, growing up, um, you know, school, university, got a job, that kind of stuff. And then really, I guess my whole life changed sort of at 28. All of a sudden, I just literally just out of the blue, it was like, I'm sick of England. I'm going to Australia. Don't know why. Didn't know a soul. 
um, arrived here with one suitcase of everything I owned in the entire world and started again, like you do. Um, probably the best decision I ever made, actually. And, um, you know, since then, I sort of, I guess, I kind of set out, I, I was able to reinvent myself in a way. Um, you know, I guess I felt very constrained in England by sort of, I guess, structured society for family and societal expectations. But once I was over here, I was able to kind of, I guess, explore myself and be a bit more myself, which was, which was lovely. So I, you know, I sort of started doing high altitude trekking just because I can, um, you know, swapped and changed businesses and jobs. You know, I'm, I've been in IT for 25 years, but, you know, I spent a year, um, I spent a year out trading the stock market um, and actually <laughs> that was actually in the GFC and I actually made enough money to sort of cover rent and bills right slap in the middle of the GFC. I decided to oh. take a year out and be a stock market trader like you do. Good timing. You know, <laughs> um, I've been a real estate investor. You know, I've, I've tried a couple of things, but I've always come back to IT. Um, and I guess really that's where I was sort of kind of about 40. I was really sort of not, I'm not, I guess I wasn't particularly going anywhere in in any great sort of speed and just life just came to a screeching halt really at 40 I'd sort of, a, a long-term relationship ended um I was very lost in directionist didn't really know where I was or who I was or what I was doing and um you know having having done the high altitude trekking it's just something that I love doing so I thought well let's go and climb the highest mountain in South America like you do because I was 40 and I'd already set a goal to do this but I went and had a gym assessment and it put me in the obese category. Now, my whole identity, my whole life, I've always been active and sporty. So my whole identity was tied up with being the fit chick. So all of a sudden here I was at 40 fat and frumpy and I was not the fit chick. And it just, it just kind of destroyed my whole sense of self. Um, and really the, the one thing I, I, I guess I um, decided was that if I didn't have my health, I had nothing. Mm. And that's really what changed things. I set about re-establishing my my identity as the fit chick I needed to find who I was and in the process of getting fit to climb Mount Kilimanjaro instead of Mount Aconcagua I lost 25 kilos without dieting um, and got so you know got into the best shape of my life but having climbed the mountain then my and having focused so exclusively on my fitness literally I'd left, the whole rest of my life fell apart um, uh, you know, I neglected all other aspects of my life and just a series of eight very bizarre events happened within this very short space of time. And by the time I went to the doctors for about the lump under my armpit, I was diagnosed with depression. Now, um, having made that decision that if I didn't have my health, I had nothing. And really with the depression, I needed something positive to focus on. And the only thing that was working in my life was the thing, ironically, that got me into that situation, which was my fitness. So I doubled down on the fitness and hired a personal trainer. And this is where the accidentally bit comes from. I got, I got so much more fit that I did a photo shoot for my 42nd birthday to reward myself for not quitting. Um, and it was at that photo shoot that the photographer said, are you doing the show? Um, what are you talking about? <laughs> I have sure. no idea what you're talking about. So I said, she said, the bodybuilding show. I said, well, I've still got no idea what you're talking about. Anyway, I went along to the show, freaked out at all of these ginormous chocolate covered muscly women with covered in fake hair and fake tan and fake nails and sparkly bikinis it was just so bizarre but I went back to my trainer the next day and said do you think I could do this thing and he was after he finished jumping around the gym in sheer delight because I didn't know I didn't know he'd been wanting me to do this I said great we've got 10 weeks and 10 weeks later I was a state state champion Wow. <laughs> and then you've <laughs> gone to one, the world champions 21 times. Well, that was it. I mean, after, after winning the state title, that's when my body fell apart. It was already, I'd already be having injuries for years, um, but I had to have double shoulder re um, reconstruction. You know, I had torn tendons in every limb, you know, fraying, fraying cartilage and all my, wow. all my joints, my hips were crumbling and I was threatened with kind of, um, double hip surgery too but again this is where my trainer was very very instrumental and actually this this speaks to the importance of having a coach I'm sure we'll delve into the importance of having coaches as well but this is where my trainer was actually very instrumental in really what's taken off from here because he actually sat me down and he literally just said to me he said Sarah you've got the size you've got the shape you've got the you've got the strength you sure as hell have the mental toughness and this is another very very key thing um, he says if we can get your body right I will make you world champion um, and he actually said that he would not have 
he would never have said that anyone else except to me. And it was because I, I had this mental toughness. Um, and literally we just, we just doubled down, got stuck in, did the work that we needed to do, literally day after day, every single day, consistent, 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 consistent. Um, and yeah, at age 40, yeah, age 45, I went overseas for the first time, won 11 straight world titles. Wow. By 49, I'm now 21 times world champion. Well, congratulations. So, so look, that, that's an incredible story, going from obese to literally the best in the world, the, the toughest sport in the world. But what I found is that the discipline that I needed for the bodybuilding has translated into my professional life. Yeah. And, you know, really, really up to, the, up to this sort of trans, transition point of, the, you know, when I got into the fitness, I was really just doing jobs that I was very capable of doing. And I've been a business analyst, a developer, you know, and I was just getting jobs that were the same. So I was just bimbling along at kind of this level, doing what I always knew I could do. Um, never really challenging myself. But once I started doing the bodybuilding, I started realizing just how powerful and strong um, I was. And then I started challenging myself in my, my career. It's like, okay, let's get a job that I haven't done before. Let's get another job, you know, stepping up. So every job I, I made a point of stepping up to the next level until, until I started at um, this software company and, and a very unexpected opportunity um, appeared and I demanded to be made the COO. Now, <laughs> 10 years ago, if you told me I was going to be a COO, it just wouldn't have happened. I mean, even gosh, even sort of three or four years ago, never was the concept of an executive level um, in a company in my head. You know, I just didn't have the belief in myself. Yeah. But like I say, the, the, the strength that I've lent for, from the bodybuilding has translated into my career so tell as me, well. Tell me about this mental toughness. You mentioned that your trainer said, you know, it, it was your mental toughness. What, what does that mean to you? Because a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people do struggle with, I guess, discipline. And I think that's, a, that's why some people lack success is because, and you mentioned, you know, just consistently doing the same thing day in, day out, day yeah. in, day out. And I think I was listening to a, um, a, an audio book by James Clear. I don't know if you've read this book. It's called Atomic Habits. And he talks about yeah. successful people get really good at doing the boring stuff. Yes, precisely. And, and yeah. look, with my, with, my, with my weight loss coach, I mean, I also do coaching on the side, particularly in a weight loss space as well as the bodybuilding space. And with my weight loss people, the, the, the approach I take is a habit-based approach. Um, there's another book actually called The Habit, uh, Habits of a Champion. And I was like, damn, I wish I'd written that book. <laughs> you know? But it is, it comes down to your habits. Yes. You know, ev literally sort of every day for the last three, you know, eight years. Yeah, you know, I've got up at half past five. I've cycled to the gym. I've done the training. You know, I've, my eating has been absolutely consistent and bang on. You know, rain, hail or shine, I get up at half past five and I cycle into the gym and I do the work that needs to be done. That's how I've done it. It's do you think that defining time for you was when you got told you were not as fit as you thought you were at 40? They yeah. said you, that, that was your defining moment. That yeah. was my defining moment because it yeah. really tore, tore right through to my, my core identity. So do you think people need to have that happen to them, that slap in the face to go, bang, here's what's going on in your life. You need to change something. Because if nothing changes, yes. nothing changes, right? Precisely. But yet so many people are just going through day to by day, doing the same thing and then whinging and complaining or maybe not even whinging and complaining, but just settling for what they've got. So what is mental toughness? I and mean, we hear this a lot. You've got to have mental toughness. You've got to hustle. You've got to do this. But how does that translate? How do we make that real world? Here's something you can tangibly do. So it's it's being prepared to do the boring stuff. I mean, yeah. when my body fell apart, I literally, like I say, the doctors were literally, literally they, I'd found this new sport that I'd loved, but the doctors were threatening to take it away again. And, you know, again, this spoke to my core identity. If I couldn't be the fit chick, who was I? So here's the thing. With, with my whole weight loss, my whole transformation, it has never been about weight loss. It's always been about a bigger thing. And it's always been about an internal thing. You know, my transformation has been fully aligned with who I am internally. Um, and this, when, it to, when you come to motivation, those who achieve lasting results are those who are motivated internally by the thing itself, rather than by an external reward. I mean, sure, yes, I've got trophies all around the house and that's lovely. But if I was, if I was just motivated by having a nice shiny trophy, I wouldn't be prepared to do the work that um, was required. It would be an on again, off again thing because once I had that shiny trophy, 
great job done next but because this because this has come from inside me and it's it's a bigger thing um it's it's always been about my identity and and like I say speak to the fit chip because i've had always this internal motivation it's allowed me to to do the boring stuff like I, I had a whole year in rehab a lot of people when they get injured you know they'll do their rehab for a couple of weeks or whatever and then they'll stop again and then they'll get re-injured again and I was going through that same in fact I was going through that same loop I was like had injuries constantly for about seven years but it wasn't till I knuckled down and did the boring stuff every single day mm. you know um, and it's <laughs> I talked. I mentioned uh, Steve Brosman and his um, his episode, the Corona Slingshot. Steve, Steve, and um, the, the show thing, a few times, Steve. Yeah, yeah, and the thing that got me with that is I've I've actually done a whole sort of webinar on what it takes to be a champion. And one of the things that you know I say is when you've got this big, hairy, audacious goal, if you look at it as a whole, you'll you'll get overwhelmed. It'll just see too nor It'll just seem too big and too enormous, and you just go, oh gosh, it's all too hard. So how do you eat the elephant? You, one bite at a time. So that's yeah. the thing. You do things one bite at a time. As long as you're doing something every single day that gets you in the direction of where you need to go, you will get there. So let's talk a bit about that because I think um, goal setting, a lot of people talk about goal setting. I actually don't think goal setting is very hard. I think a lot of people can goal set really easily because it is just about saying, I want that. That's yep. what I want. It's an idealization, right? I, that, that would be ideal. Yep. Where people struggle, and, and look, we know yeah, at the, the turn of every year, people set goals. They're called New Year's resolutions, right? Really simple to set. Yep. But very few people achieve their goals. And yep. the reason for that, I think, I, I would love to know a bit from your perspective, why do you think that is? Because, you know, you set, you've, you set a goal to climb uh, a mountain, which I love as, as a, a reference because a mountain is very definable that you know when you're at the top because you can't step any further, right? It's thin air. And you know that to get to the top, it's one step at a time. There's no other way to get there if you're walking up a mountain. It's, it's exactly, one precisely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a brilliant metaphor for life. It really is. Yeah, but, but, so, but what it sounded to me when you told us a bit about your story, the beginning there was you had to make some massive sacrifices to be able to achieve that goal. And some of that was personal relationships. Some of it was other, you know, other parts of your life. What? Well, it, it wasn't really, I mean, the relation, my, my long-term relationship had already ended. So okay, yep, yep. Um, like I say, it comes back to this motivation internally or externally. Now, when you're, when you're externally motivated, uh, you're, you're motivated by a reward or getting away from pain. Um, so for example, let's just say, let's just say you wanted to lose the weight. If I'd wanted to lose the weight and it's like, oh, I don't want to be fat. I would have probably done everything that I, in my power to get to the point where I wasn't fat. But once I wasn't fat, then it'd be like, oh, I'm not fat anymore. Great. The motivation ceases to exist. Okay. But because my motivation came from internally, it's always like, I want to, you know, it was, it was phrased, I guess, as an, I want, as a, as opposed to, I don't want. And because it was an I want, it was something I truly wanted inside myself, then it, it, it just pulls me towards it. And when you've got something that pulls you towards it and you enjoy doing the thing for the sake of itself, then your motivation is much stronger and more consistent. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So how do you stay focused on that though? So, because I think what happens is um, people set goals and then life gets in the way. And, we, yeah. and, and then we Look, start making a lot of it, it as, as you alluded to before, it comes back to habits. Mm. So what I, what I developed was the skills and the tools and the habits um, that allowed me to keep doing, doing what I needed to do consistently. So, so one of the things I learned is I learned how to get incredibly efficient. And, you know, this is from the body. I learned how to be incredibly efficient at preparing my food so that I always had some healthy food on hand and I always had food that worked for my current goal, you know? So, so that included things like, you know, planning my shopping trip, for example. So I'd literally spend 15 minutes a week planning my food. Now, most people plan their lives, they plan their holidays, they plan where they're going for a beer on a Friday, they plan their meetings at work, but very few people plan what they're going to eat. Mm. This is why a lot of people really struggle when they're on a weight loss journey, for example, because they don't plan what they're gonna eat. So I'd spend yeah. 15 minutes planning, and because I knew exactly what I was, I was going to get, I'd literally go to the shops, just get that and come back. So my shopping became incredibly efficient. So I was saving time all the way. And because I prepared everything in bulk, again, I was saving time. I was saving brain space as well because I didn't need to think. 
you know, all of a sudden I'm not wondering what I'm going to have for lunch or wondering what I'm going to have for dinner, you know, so then I'm not tempted to go. It's like, oh, it's all too hard. I haven't got anything in the fridge anyway. I'll go and get the takeaway. Because so you, that have situation you these, wasn't there. Have you taken these skills now and now applied them to business? Because, you, you know, it sounds to me like uh, these would be very valuable in business yeah. as well. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, this is this is how I'm able to run a full time job and coach people outside because I've got these app, these processes absolutely locked down. And with with my working life as well, I have these routines. So, for example, and this is I stole this idea completely out of Tim Ferriss's four hour work week, just doing my emails in slots. So I have a slot for doing emails morning and afternoon. That's it. I don't touch my emails outside of those because emails are just the biggest times, you know, time waste going. Yeah. So my emails get done in this slot and that slot, and otherwise they don't. Um, same thing with, you know, and because I'm doing this bodybuilding, I needed to make sure that my eating was on track. You know, this comes down to the discipline. So I would block book the times of day I was eating, not because I need to know when to eat, but it's to train everybody else around me what is important to me. And then if somebody did book a meeting when I was eating, I'd go, no, I'd push back. Set boundaries. So this is the thing, my, my whole working life as well, and this is where the disciplines come in, I set boundaries. I have, you know, I block book things at particular times of the day. So everybody around me knows exactly when I'm doing what and when they can, when I'm available for them kind of thing. So it trains people around me what my yeah. boundaries are. Yeah, that's very smart because I think yeah. um, that's one of the challenges people are faced with is, that, is they don't want to upset other people. Yeah. And so you you might set something, a goal for yourself or decide that something's important to you, but then somebody else will come into your space and come up with something they want to do and it, and it can conflict, but because you don't want to upset them. So that, that, it's the old people pleaser thing, isn't it? So it sounds to me like you're quite, once you're quite focused on what you want to do, you're very good at sticking to what you want to do some people aren't great at that have you yeah. got tips for people that might struggle with doing that telling people no this is my time i've got to do this or i'm only gonna check my emails twice a day because a lot of people would struggle with that as well i do the same thing but i know a lot of people would struggle with it yeah look it's it's about oh crikey what is it about really um again yes it's a learned process i mean i i throughout my whole working life i've pretty much always just done a nine to five I go home at five o'clock every day, no matter how busy I am. It's very, very rare that I don't go home at five o'clock. Um, even now I'm CEO, I go home at five o'clock because um, that, <laughs> that actually came from my very first job straight out of university. I, was, I just happened to live five minutes down the road from where I worked. And I, because, you're, because you're a sort of fresh graduate and stuff and you want to please your, your employer kind of thing, I worked sort of 15 hour days, seven days a week um, for months on end. And then I had the temerity to ask for two days off in lieu over Christmas. And they said, no, ha, huh, right. Um, and that gave me a massive loyalty lesson. And I, and I, right from there go, I go, well, you know, I'm a professional person. You can pay me for what, for the hours I do. You're con I'm contracted for 40 hours a week. I'm going to work 40 hours a week. And from that point on, I've worked 40 hours a week because that's what I'm paid to do. Um, so that was a that was a very very early lesson, and I guess about setting boundaries. Mm. Um, and here's the thing: I've never had an issue with it. Nobody's had an issue with it because as long as I get my work done in the time that I'm there, and this is why having these other structures in place it allows you to be incredibly productive within a much shorter space of time. If you if you if you stop doing these time wasting activities or squish them all into a finite space. It means you've got more space for the rest of the day to actually get stuff done. Yeah. So let, let's talk a bit about being a world champion because that's pretty um, awesome. And um, I don't want to brush over that, you know, 21 times. twenty. I, I mean, I know there'd be a lot of people that maybe have done it one, no, like they've done it once and they feel like they've, they've achieved something. You've done it 21 times and you and you competed, I think you said about 80 times when we pre, in the pre-chat before I hit the record button. Yeah, look, I've done over 80 lineups, which is quite a lot anyway, in the space of the last eight years. Um, and I've got a 96% success top five or win success rate in that eight years, which is a staggeringly um, high percentage. And, you know, fully 25% of my, my wins have been at the world level. So, so for somebody who's done that, um, and it may be, I don't know if it's even easy for you to answer this, why do you think you were able to do that and others can't? I guess it's because, uh, and this, this comes back to my trainer saying I've got the mental toughness, because, I've, um, because I'm prepared to do the boring little things. 
the one percenters that count. Yeah. Um, now, now, actually, when I joined CXI, like I say, when I stepped up to COO, I literally, I literally changed that within three weeks. I got a 450% performance improvement um, in three weeks. Um, and it's because I implemented structure and process. Yeah. And it's, so it sounds to me like that's vitally important because it, the more, I mean, you, you talk about efficiency, the more you can take guesswork out of what's got to be done, the better. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Everything, everything becomes routine. Once things become routine, it, it frees your mind up. You, you know, you're not, you're not second guessing. You're not doubting yourself because it's, it's just routine. It's like, okay, this is what we do today. So, you know, at work, we run on a two week cycle. So, you know, every two weeks uh, we have, set we have a set cadence we set things up we run in two weeks we review what worked what didn't work what, what can be changed now i was going to ask we that, feed what, that what, yeah we yeah, feed okay. that forward because we run, we run the agile methodology um i'm an agile coach too so this is it everything's a routine we have a we have a daily check-in what did you do yesterday what am i doing today what's blocking me okay once a fortnight we have the weekly we have the the end of sprint review what worked, what didn't work, what can be improved. So we're always checking in and reviewing and making small tweaks and adjustments along the way. So that's what keeps us on track because we never veer too far off course. Yeah. And so, and does everyone have their own KPIs that are set on a fortnightly basis, quarterly basis? How do you go about setting? I, I set them quarterly KPIs. Okay. So, so, we, so we've got, we've got a, um, we have an annual if you like, we have annual targets, quarterly targets for the team, um, and then we have personal quarterly targets as well. And are these, are and then the we have fortnight, uh, this fortnightly and daily cycle as well. Yeah, and and you're reviewing these KPIs of those fortnightly catch-ups yep. or daily catch-ups. When do you? No, no, no. The the personal KPIs are quarterly. The team the team KPI is also quarterly. Yeah, because I, I quite often talk to people about climbing Mount Everest. It's uh you know and, and I, I I have I've only met a couple of people that have actually done it. Um, but when, when you talk about Mount Everest, it's very easy to define getting to the top. But I always say to people, if you set the goal of getting to the top of Mount Everest, it's quite an overwhelming goal. It's 8,848 yeah. metres. Very, very yeah. tall mountain. Might have, I think it might have moved slightly, but some, somewhere up there. But if you walked, if you just did 12 metres a day over two years, you'd get to the top. Now, of course, yeah. there's going to be other things that happen to stop you from achieving that yeah. goal if you're not looking out for those things. So how do you allow for that? I mean, it's good to plan and say that's where we're heading. Um, how do you allow for things like the coronavirus just came along and interrupted everybody's plans, didn't it? So how do you allow for things like that? Or how do you pivot when that happens? Well, I mean, we run a very agile, I mean, the, the methodology we run at work is agile. And by its very nature, it, it allows flexibility and pivoting. And this, this short cadence as well allows you to check, you know, with these, with these checkpoints is also what allows us this pivoting. It's like, I, you know, I, I could set the roadmap and the, the high level strategic direction and then we pull it back. So, so on the wall, what I did at, on the wall at work is I created a five-year roadmap, a two-year roadmap, then I telescoped it down into a six-month plan, fortnightly plan. Um, but again, I review that every two weeks. Are we still on track? Are we, are we making the progress we need? If not, then I shuffle things around. So we're always having this review process. And I guess like with, once you, once you know the overall goal, and, and I'll go back to Mount Kilimanjaro, because once I knew the overall goal, here's the big picture. I'm going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Now that's a huge thing. You know, I was like, mm. how the hell am I going to do that? But once you've got that overall goal in that direction, then you can start pulling back into what your action steps need to be. So it's like, okay, well, if I'm going to get fit enough to climb this mountain, what's the first thing I need to do? Right, well, I need to get fit because I'm not fit. I've just been told I'm a beast. I'm not fit, so I have to get fit. Okay, how do I get fit? Well, I probably need to start doing some exercise. Okay, what sort of exercise do I need to do? Well, I really like cycling. I'll cycle, I'll cycle to the gym, all right. Um, I know from previous high altitude trekking that it really helps if you've got good strength, leg strength, right? I'll get on the stepper machine at the gym, you know? Um, so once you've got that overall direction, then you can pull it back into, um, it's a smaller, you know, it comes back to this whole elephant bite-sized chunks. I mean, yes, yeah. uh, there's a number and number of ways of doing these things, but if you've got a yearly goal, an annual goal, then you might want to break it down into quarters. Where do I need to be this quarter? Where do I need to be this quarter? Where do I need to be this quarter? Okay, if I'm going to achieve this quarter's goals, what do I need to do on this week, this week, and this week? 
And then if I'm going to achieve the weekly goal, what am I going to do on a daily basis? So you pull it down into smaller and smaller um, focuses. And then yeah. you can actually, you can literally just tick them off. It's like, okay, did I achieve this day, this day's goal? If how, how did, do you brilliant, go, move on to the next day's goal. How, how do you go? I mean, it's good for you. In, I mean, definitely you've, you've worked out how to be very disciplined and just and get stuff done you've become very efficient and it sounds like you've learned a lot of lessons from your you know from your bodybuilding your personal trainer that you had and now you're coaching other people how do you go with your team though let's say you, you go to those uh, those reviews in t- every two weeks and you find there are team members that are not hitting their targets or they're not staying focused they're not doing the boring stuff and they're not and, and they're just how do you manage that because that's a big challenge for a lot of business leaders yeah i, I put it back on them I put the back, you know, this is the thing. My, my method of leadership is, is known as servant leadership. Um, it's also kind of like a bottom-up leadership in a way. So I lead through my team. You know, I let them come to me. You know, I, I, I set, what do I, I, what do I, the way I describe it is I kind of um, show them the road and then my job is to remove the rocks from the road so they can just walk along it. That's the, that's the way I see my leadership style. And, um, I found that because I basically facilitate and trust my team, they've actually stepped up themselves and they take a great deal of pride and responsibility in their own work. And I find that, you know, once I've set them the overall direction and given them a a target, I find that they tend to come to me if they know they're not going to hit it. And that's fine. That's great. And I encourage that because then it's like, okay, brilliant. You've come to me early enough we can we can review this and we can think about how what we can do about it yeah you know, so we, so i i give yeah. them the space to take responsibility for their own actions yeah i love it i think that, that's that so they important, know i support them mm-hmm. yeah they've got to take responsibility but you've got to support them and i like that's the right. fact that you've given them an opportunity to be able to communicate you with early enough that you can say so you can do something about it. Cause that's a big problem if they don't, isn't it? Like for you as a yeah. leader of the business, tell me how has the coronavirus affected you guys? Have you seen much of a, an effect on you and your team or your business? Um, in terms of actual work, the ways we work, no, because it, uh, we're a cloud-based, we're a cloud-based software as a service company. Beautiful. You know, <laughs> our whole business continuity plan involves working from home. So, so we're living our business continuity plan every day. Um, and it, it hasn't changed. Now, it has impacted performance a little bit, yes, because we don't, uh, we don't have the collaboration. You know, I've, I've increased the frequency of our check-ins. We usually just did one daily check-in. I've now increased it to twice daily. So that's actually been another way that we've maintained a lot of performance is by increasing the frequency of the check-ins. So, t- so tell me about these check-ins from a tactical point of view. Is this everyone jumping on a Zoom call together? Is that one-on-ones? Is it? No, nope, everybody on the Zoom call. And, and is it five yeah, so minutes, 10 minutes, an hour? What is it? A quarter of an hour. Okay. Oh, great. So half past nine every day, quarter of an hour. What did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? Do you have any impediments? And it's just helping each other through whatever yeah. that needs and to it be. Does. It does. Yeah. And it just, and like I said, the reason I implemented it twice daily is to just to give everybody that because we're remote, you know, it is nice to see other people. So it just, mm-hmm. it just gives us that sense of belonging still and that sense of community. Um, like I say, performance has been impacted a little bit, but not, but not overly. Yeah. Um, and besides those uh, doubling the check-ins and, you, you know, I'm sure you're using something cloud-based for that, <laughs> like Zoom. Zoom. <laughs> Good uh, old Zoom. Yeah. Are there other things that you've found you've needed to do to really help keep the momentum through this period that have worked well? Um, not really. Like I say, because, because we've... Because we've established, we've over the whole of the last, I guess, year and a half that I've, I've sort of been, uh, I guess, coaching and, and I guess, grooming the team in these processes and these routines, it's now so ingrained that they just do it. Mm. And this, this is the key. It's, it's like any habit. I mean, you've, you've probably heard it takes 21 days to develop a habit. Well, it can take anywhere from sort of 18 to 250 days, depending on the size of the habit. But that what develops the habit is continually doing it, continually practicing it. Mm. And once it becomes, once it becomes a habit, then it just becomes something that you just do. So like I say, having spent a whole year with these guys, really empowering them and, and driving the process home, it's now just, it's running itself kind of thing. 
Yeah, which is which is I mean, much, uh, habit is where, where it's all at because habits yeah. and habits can be good or habits can be bad. <laughs> so yeah, you know, how do you change if someone's got a bad habit or if you've got a bad habit yourself? How do you have you got any tips for helping people turn that around? Yeah, so I guess with I guess when I'm working with um, I guess my competitors and my weight loss clients, you know, I, again I turn it back on them. It's like what I you know, and I dig into what what is the benefit they're deriving from doing that bad habit because there's always a benefit that they're deriving mm. from that bad habit. And the problem is because because habits like forty percent of what we do sort of every day is completely unconscious. People people have these habits and they don't really realize. Um, that they're being driven unconsciously, but all of these things that they do, that's not necessarily ideal or getting them to, to where they want to go, it'll have a trigger. So we have to establish what the trigger is. And once the trick, something's been triggered, there's always a reward. So that, so the components of a habit are there's a trigger, there's a reward, and there's an emotion that goes with that. Yeah. So once we can dig into that and identify what the trigger is, and the reward, then we can come up with an alternative. So you might still have the same trigger, but can we do an alternative reward that's just as emotionally satisfying? Yeah, which is important, isn't it? Because And it's identifying that uh, and being able to yeah. identify that. I think that's where coaching is so important. Yeah, tell, absolutely. Yeah, tell me about, um, I mean, from a coaching perspective, what do you, I mean, you're obviously very a big fan of coaching, not just in business, but personal life as well. Yep. Um, and, you know, have you found that there are some people that just aren't coachable or that you can't have them? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what yes. do you think that is? <laughs> um, gosh, I mean, there's a, there's a number of reasons. Fear primarily is one of them. Fear of failure. Um, fear of what other people think. So fear is a big driver. Um, gosh, and like there's it's some people, some people just, some of it's ego too. Um you know, I worked with a, I worked with a, a client, or, or sorry, a, a chap came to me three years ago and he wanted um, training and he wanted to step on stage as a competitor. And I told him exactly what he needed to do. Anyway, three weeks later, he came back to me and he hadn't done any of it because he knew better. Mm. So I started working with him again for about six weeks. And after six weeks, he, he sacked me because he knew better. I'm like, you want to compete? You've gone to the best in the world for training advice and you've sat them because you're better. So this person was not coachable. Yeah. So it's very important, isn't it? If you want to grow, you have to be willing to. You have to be willing to let go. And, and this, again, this comes back to my whole thing with my trainer. What he saw in me was somebody who was utterly coachable. I, I mean, you know, I have a ferocious curiosity about everything. So when I started training with him, literally I was firing questions at him all the time. It's like, why are we doing this? What's the purpose of this? Why are we do? And he, he was just like bombarded with his physical disorder. You know, he took it really quite personally. He's like, is this person questioning me? Is she questioning who I am? Is she questioning my abilities? But then he figured out it was just sheer curiosity. And I wanted to learn. I was soaking this up. And because I took that attitude in, you know, I wanted to learn. It made me incredibly coachable because he would just say, he, as soon as he would say, we're doing this because this, oh, I get it. Right. Yeah. Let's do it. Is that important for you though? Like, cause to me, sometimes I, especially if I have good rapport with someone, I just trust them. They say, do this. Uh, if, yeah. if you've done it before me, I'll just do them. Some people need to know why they're doing what they're doing, don't they? Yeah. Look, every, everybody's different. Um, but when you're in a coaching relationship, trust is very, very key. It, re it really is the key. Um, if you're going to, if you're going to, uh, you know, spend money with a coach, you presumably have, there's a reason that you want to work with that person. They're an expert in the, their field, whatever it is, they can get you to the next phase of your life or your career or something like that. But fundamentally, you're entering in a relationship and that involves trust. That's very, very key. Yeah. And what, you, and what is high performance? I mean, you call yourself a high performance coach. How, you know, what does that actually mean? Does that mean that, you, that people are always going to be bouncing off the ceilings and within no, it? No, 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 uh, not at all. I mean, you know, I, I have, I have good days. I have bad days. I have days when I can't be, you know, I just don't want to get out of bed. What I mean by high performance is the fact that the, the, the routines and structures I have in place is what keeps me healthy day in, day out. It allows me to, to, you know, be the COO of a software company, 
and coach people outside of outside of my job and do my own bodybuilding training and do my own bodybuilding competition preparation and travel internationally when I'm down at 6% body fat, which is medically unsafe without falling over in a heap. That's high performance. It's because I have these habits and structures in place that ensure that I'm always fueled appropriately for the workload I have in place. And I have structures in place that mean that everything's kind of in a box. So it's like, here's my training box. And I have my eating around my training. Then I have my work box with eating associated with it. Then I have my coaching box. So I have, I have all of these boxes that I just, it's like, okay, now I need to be in this headspace because I'm at work. So I'm in my work headspace. Then I leave at five o'clock, put that box away. Now I'm in my coaching box because I have everything in boxes kind of thing. And I've built the, the structures that allow me just to literally run these routines and these, these, this cadence. Yeah. It doesn't involve any extra thinking and it doesn't involve stress. I mean, one of my, my team members last year, she said to me, she said, Sarah, you, Sarah, you're doing this, 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 and this, you're competing, traveling, but you're not stressed. I said, no, I don't have stress because everything is very structured and routine and it's become so ingrained and habitual that it doesn't cause me stress. So do you it's use, uh, are you very checklist driven, flowchart driven, or how do you, like, is it, or is it all internal? Do you have, you know, do you get up in the morning and have a look at your diary and go, here's my checklist for today. I've got to work through. How do you, how do you make that work for you? Well, like I say, because I've been doing it so long now, I guess it's, it's yeah. just ingrained. I don't even have to think about it. It just happens. Just happens. Yeah. what I do. It's who exactly. I am now. Yes. When I started, I used to log everything. I used to log, I, you know, so I count my calories. I track my macros. I, log on my training um i did used to do all of that stuff but as i did it more and more and more i found i needed to do that less and less and less yeah well well done 21 times world champion is is uh, i tell you what very very impressive thank you um and to turn your life around like that i I'm, you know i can only imagine what that would have taken and how it feels to be now in that position is there anything that um that i should have asked that i didn't ask is there something that maybe you've got some pearls of wisdom that you could share that that I've missed out on somewhere? No, look, I think, I think we've covered quite a lot, really. Um, I guess, you know, to summarise it, in terms of, you know, I guess in terms of improving your performance, whether it's a personal performance or even at work, the key that I found is consistent, consistency and accountability are the two absolute keys. Mm. And, and doing the little things, these one percenters, just you're just doing something every single day, you know, so that it becomes so ingrained. It just becomes what you do. Yeah. I like that. You know, and, and always fuel yourself appropriately for the work, the load you've got. You know, a lot of people, when they get very, very sort of stressed and overwhelmed, the first thing that goes is their food. The way you can flip that around is if you're completely stressed and crazy is actually to focus more on making sure that you're taking the time out to fuel yourself appropriately for your workload. Because it's when you fuel yourself that you're actually also, cre you know, I call it creating space. I create space for my health. I create space for being a high performance person because I have these, you know, block booked off times. You know, that's another reason that I block booked these eating times. It gives me these nano times during the day of off times when I'm just, I have this me time and anything that's, you know, stressing me or whatever, it's just churning around in my brain and I can't find an answer to by taking myself out of the situation offline, go get a cup of coffee, go and have like, you know, a bit of a salad or something like that and focus purely on that, that completely non-work related activity, you find that solutions actually just percolate. So give yourself, you know, create space for you, yourself. Yeah. And I'm, I'm hearing, I mean, there's lots of themes coming through our discussion today, and I'm really grateful that you've taken the time out to chat with us, but I feel like we've just scratched the surface. You know, I'd love to be able to plug a USB into your head and, and download the, <laughs> the <laughs> download the thinking, because I think a lot of it is mindset. And to me, there's a few keys in there. Number one is discipline, learning yep. to say no, even though that can be tough, um, you know, carving out time for what's important, whether that's eating, health, exercise, um, you know, me time, et cetera. But there's lots of different things in there. And, and I think you're right. It's just lots of little things. It's not yep. one big thing, is no. it? The 1%, it's 101%ers, not yep. one at a hundred percent. It's 101%ers, not one at a hundred percent. Precisely. You know, you, but you have to look after yourself first. 
If you don't look after yourself first, you can't look any, after anyone else. And, I, and I'll give you a very good example of something that I just did. When I started another job, um, you know, there was a lady that classic people pleaser. She was in at seven o'clock every day. She was still there every day at eight o'clock. Um, and she just, she just sort of came to me after a couple of weeks and said, Sarah, how, how come you're not, you're not stressed or anything like that? And says, this is exactly what I do. And I, she was classic people pleaser. And she struggled with this. But I, I got her to book herself just a half hour lunchtime because she'd never done that before. I got her to book half an hour lunchtime and not be at her desk. And she struggled with that. That was the hardest thing in the world because she was like, oh, yeah, she, you know, she's such a people. It's obviously a habit, yeah. Yeah, habit. Um, she couldn't say no. But I would actually just go and run around and go, it's lunchtime. It's lunchtime. I didn't have to do this, but I did it for her. Um, and she, she started getting the hang of it and she started enjoying it. And she, came to me, she actually ended up losing about six kilos without changing anything else just from, from that half hour space because it was giving her that space to de-stress. Yeah, so important. So important. Mm. Well, I, can't, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. But how do people find out more if they want to get a hold of you or learn more about your journey? All right. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Sarah Taylor, um, Agile Champion on LinkedIn. And um, my Facebook page is uh, Sarah Taylor Posing and Prep Coach. So that's my bodybuilding page. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll make sure those go, that all those links go into the show notes. So if you're listening okay. to this and you want to get a hold of Sarah, head across to businessbrainfood.com.au. Look for episode 259 or you can put Sarah Taylor into the search box. I'm sure this will pop straight up and uh, and you'll be able to find those links there. Once again, Sarah, thanks so much for sharing your secrets with us. You're welcome. As many as, many as you could in a, in a half hour or so block anyway. Well, there's plenty more where that came from. I mean, yeah, we could dig into the whole mindset thing. That's a fascinating thing i actually did a podcast with a with a psychologist around this whole coronavirus and how you manage this because and that was that was brilliant i loved it well sounds like a future uh episode for sure <laughs> when we'll get together well if you enjoy, to enjoy today's episode as much as i have make sure you head across to your favorite podcast player leave an honest review or rating and uh, let us know what you think we love to read all of your reviews and just a reminder that today's podcast episode was brought to you by maxmyprofit.com.au the team at maxmyprofit help you build the business you imagined so if you imagine having a business that ran smoother that made you more money or gave you the time and freedom to do the things that you love in life but instead you've got a big ball and chain that locks you down that you feel like you can cannot escape from that relies on you being there and uh, keeps you awake at night wondering how you're going to pay your next bill you need to talk to the team at maxmyprofit.com.au uh, we've got business accelerators there on standby waiting to help you build the business that you imagined all righty thanks again for tuning into the podcast my name is ben futrell it's been an absolute pleasure uh, being your host thanks again to sarah for joining us today and sharing her wisdom 21 times world champion my goodness me what a great person to get onto the podcast so grateful to have your time today Sarah, and thank you for listening in to the very end of this podcast. You are amazing. Until next week, have a very profitable day. See ya. All right, there we go. We're still live in the Brain Food Group on Facebook. I'm just going to finish that up now. Thank you so much for joining us in the Business Brain Food Group. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Make sure you uh, leave some comments below the feed here and leave a review. Go and check out Sarah's website or Sarah's LinkedIn page. I'm just going to shoot and go end live Facebook.